This is Atmospheric Greenhouse Gas Pollution, November 2016. Is it possible that the global surface temperature increase this year, 2016, could be 1.25 degrees C? Is it possible that atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration could have increased by 3.62 parts per million in the past 12 months, in just one year? Is it possible that global emissions will be one-third higher in 2030 than they are today? Well, that's what the latest data and the latest reports are telling us. I'm Peter Carter. It is November 2016, and I'm presenting in this video to you the current atmospheric greenhouse gas pollution situation with the very latest data and important very latest reports of this month November. I check the data and keep them recorded on a regular basis on my stateofourclimate.com website. I'm starting by getting our feet firmly planted on the atmospheric greenhouse gas pollution ground by a quick reference to the most, possibly the most important uh, sentence from the IPCC 2014 AR5 assessment. This is from the Synthesis Report, the summary from po for policymakers, and the headline statement, which says mitigation, be that 2 degrees C or hopefully under 1.5 degrees C, would require, quote, substantial emissions reductions over the next few decades and near-zero emissions of carbon dioxide and other long-lived greenhouse gases. By uh, classification of the IPCC, the main long-lived greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. So this statement is as definite as anything can ever get. Uh, this is the statement of all the world scientists, and it has the approval of all the world's governments. So, on with the data. This is from the NOAA, the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. This is recent monthly atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration from the standard monitoring site at Mauna Loa. This is the past 12 months. It's updated October 2016. This is the 12 months from uh, going back from September 2016 to 2015. And you see that in that 12 months, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration increased by 3.4 parts per million. This is the global carbon dioxide, the recent global concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide. And this is even higher. Going from August of 2016 back to August of 2015, it increased by 3.62 parts per million in that past 12 months. And on the reports that I also had a quick introduction to on the little trailer of this video, global emissions are actually set to increase greatly over the next few decades according to all policies and all plans when, of course, as we've just seen, they have to be declining greatly. So while global emissions must decline substantially over the next few decades, today's greenhouse gas policy situation is that global emissions will not decline till at least 2030 to 2040, and even then, they will still be on an increasing trajectory. This is uh, one of the reports from the IEA, the International Energy Administration. This is a report uh, published this month, November, Carbon Dioxide Emissions from Fossil Fuel Combustion. This goes from 1971 up to the uh, last year recorded, 2014. This is the very latest record. You'll see the sources, the fossil fuel sources, are coal, which is still by far the biggest one, oil here, and natural gas up here. I did take a little bit of a closer look because we had heard that perhaps over the past year or two that fossil fuel CO2 emissions might have stopped increasing altogether. It doesn't really look like they've stopped altogether. 
They've slowed down, but then they've slowed down in the past, over the previous decades. Anyhow, the important thing from this graph is that emissions of carbon dioxide from fossil fuels have never, ever been higher. Turning to the latest uh, global surface temperature increase, this is from Gavin Smith, as is the next slide, and he is the director of NASA GISS. This shows the big jump in, uh, shocking jump, made the headlines of uh, temperature in 2015, which NASA told us was 1.13 degrees C. We had gone over 1 degree C by quite a bit. This big jump is this year, 2015. This is also from Gavin Smith. This was this he put out very recently, in which he said, we are now locked in to a temperature increase this year of 1.25 degrees C. We're looking now at atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration, and of course that's the reason why we're getting these uh, big jumps in uh, global surface temperature increase. Although, of course, there was a, a boost uh, by the uh, El Nino influence. However, this temperature increase and the carbon dioxide concentration increase are still going high, high, high. This you see from 1960 up to 2016. It's from Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And this is uh, today because uh, Scripps keeps these updated on a regular weekly and daily basis. So you can see that clearly this is an accelerating uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration. And Scripps says CO2 is accelerating. We are now above 400 parts per million here. And I put this line here because this is 350 parts per million, considered the long-term danger limit for the climate, for ice sheets, and for the oceans. I have put 300 parts per million at the bottom here because that is the maximum atmospheric CO2 concentration over the past 800,000 years from the ice core record. This is one of the things that I record on a regular basis on that website, State of Our Climate. This is the atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations of the 6th of November this year, 2016. This is from Mauna Loa. I've taken two time intervals, one an extremely short time interval of just uh, from 2013, and the other one on the uh, lower level here is from 2000. On the 2000 records, I've uh, traced out the mean atmospheric concentrations because they don't show up too well. This then is carbon dioxide. I have carbon dioxide here, methane here, and nitrous oxide here. So this is seasonal adjusted carbon dioxide concentration. This is the mean methane concentration in the atmosphere, and this is mean nitrous oxide. The very, very short time frame um, is good because the, uh, the means show up uh, much better without me having to trace them out. Um, it also shows its proof of the extreme rate of increase of all of these three atmospheric greenhouse gases. So let's take a closer look at this uh, just a few years from 2013 of the uh, rapid increase in atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations that this shows. So here's carbon dioxide. I make atmospheric carbon dioxide uh, now at 405 parts per million. Seemed like only yesterday that it made headlines at 400 parts per million. Uh, methane, atmospheric methane, I get at 1,865 parts per billion. Uh, that's pretty uh, extreme because the 800,000 year ice core record maximum of atmospheric methane is 800 parts per billion. You remember that the 800,000 year maximum of carbon dioxide is 300 parts per million. And here we are with nitrous oxide. Uh, it's almost at 330 parts per billion. I get it at 329.9 parts per billion. So you can very clearly see the mean traces here and how incredibly fast 
they are currently increasing, all three, particularly atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration. Here is the uh, close-up of that atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration uh, NOAA record just from 2013. Uh, the uh, seasonally adjusted mean is uh, very obvious here and uh, what is happening and the trend with the accelerating atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration is very clear. I'm now turning to the oceans. We have a, um, a disastrous, terrible situation happening in our oceans as well as the climate. And ocean heat content, as you see here on this graph, this is also accelerating. Not surprisingly, because the atmospheric carbon dioxide is accelerating. This is the deep ocean heat that I've taken from the NOAA. It goes up to uh, June of 2016, and it starts at 1960. As I say, this is the deeper ocean heat content going down to 2,000 meters. So um, here's the uh, joules. This is an incredible amount of heat that's uh, being stored, being added to the oceans continually. It, uh, it amounts to uh, one Hiroshima bomb, I think, being exploded every second. It is enormous. Again in the oceans and again from NOAA. This is ocean acidification. This graph is to 2011, but I put it here because it's a very, very nice, clear graph. So the pH is declining on a steady rate of decline. As pH declines, acidification increases. It increases actually um, per, per metric more than the pH be, uh, by a factor of 10. Uh, that's according to the Woods Hole Institute. So, of course, uh, this is all due to uh, the uh, rapidly increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide because that's the sole cause of ocean acidification. I put this in because this is very clear. Uh, this comes from the uh, IPCC AR5 and there's pH here. This starts at 1950, 2000 here, and 2020 there. So that allows me to give you the ocean acidification, the trend, right up to 2015. And you can see that's accelerating. Um, as the uh, WMO reported 18 months ago in a special issue on ocean acidification, that it is accelerating. This slide here is ocean deoxygenation. Ocean deoxygenation is caused actually by ocean warming, by ocean heating. This is also from the IPCC AR5. Here's the ocean uh, content in percentage on this side here. And um, this is 2015 up to here. So again, uh, the same sort of thing. A uh, rapid decline, which uh, is indeed an accelerating rate of declining ocean oxygen content. We're now passing to the reports, the very recent reports that I mentioned. This is from the International Energy Agency, the IEA, published November of this year, 2016, especially for the UN COP22 in Marrakesh, Morocco, which is happening right now. This is called Energy, Climate Change and Environment. This is a stunning and extremely important report because it uh, it projects, it tells us where we are headed with our emissions by 2030. Here are the emissions, uh, here's the heading uh, projected by the IEA. This is called the INDC scenario. INDCs is United Nations Intended Nationally Determined Contributions, so it's the Voluntary National Emissions Targets. As you can see, by 2030, they are substantially higher than they are today. And in actual fact, the uh, IEA says that the global emissions increase will be 30% by 2030. But that's not all, because these are the emissions that IEA reports from energy-related activities. So this does not include the other very large sources 
of uh, methane in particular and nitrous oxide in particular and also uh, very large sources of carbon dioxide in addition. So this is uh, really, although it is stunning as I say, it is really an understatement of the full predicament that we are in and that we are headed towards. This uh, green line down here is the 450 scenario called by the IEA. This is the scenario for a uh, uh, chance uh, of uh, 2 degrees C um, global temperature increase, but that is only actually to uh, 2100, and the IEA is uh, very properly aware of that. The global temperature increase projected by the IEA from this huge increase over just a couple of decades is 2.7 degrees C, far above 2 degrees C, which itself is catastrophic, by 2100, and that is over 3 degrees C after 2100. It's 3 degrees C after 2100 because of the ocean, therm ocean thermal inertia, all that heat that you just saw, stored in the uh, oceans from the addition of global heating atmospheric greenhouse gases in the lower atmosphere. It's also going to be higher because you see this trajectory is still on an increasing trend. I'm going to show you the quotes in, in a minute. Um, this is the uh, other very important um, uh, point that the IEA shows us. When is the peaking? When does the peak have to happen for us to have a chance at uh, 2 degrees C? And it's right here. That's where the peak is. Oh, this bridge scenario, um, I, I'm not going into that, so I've sort of excluded that because I just wanted to show the two really important uh, projections that the IEA makes. So the peak you can see is between 2017 and 2018. I put it up here on a sort of inset um, uh, to see on the video. You could probably expand it and take a closer look at it yourself. Oh, and by the way, this reminds me to mention that my, my intention on this uh, video is to um, in, encourage you to look at these particular sources because they are updated and check on what I'm saying and, um, uh, and, and check deeper into the sources because I'm only skimming the surface here, that's for sure. Uh, continuing with the IEA, uh, this very important uh, report for COP22, here's the table of global energy and process, uh, that's just uh, rolled into energy as well, greenhouse gas emissions in the IND scenario. And it's given by the IEA in gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. The graph I just showed was carbon dioxide equivalent. That accounts for methane, and IEA also accounts for a small amount of nitrous oxide in this. But this is just only the energy-related emissions, as I say. I'm sorry I keep repeating it, because, because it is really important. Uh, stunningly bad, though, this is, as I say. Um, here's the actual quote uh, from the report. Implementing the INDCs, quote, in this analysis, global emissions under the NDCs nationally determined contributions, uh, national emissions targets, are one third higher in 2030 than they are today. So, there it is. Uh, here's the other one, which is very interesting from the point of view of the peaking, getting to 2 degrees C from the, from the NDCs, as the IA calls them. Um, 2 degrees C is, is, is catastrophe. Uh, we have to aim for under 1.5 degrees C, as most of the scientists are saying now. I, was, uh, pre I presented at the Oxford uh, 1.5 degree conference um, just recently this year in Oxford, England. So we are, we are at last, thank, thank goodness, looking at 1.5 degrees C, and we're going to have to, as you see, we're going to have to react immediately in order to have any chance of that. This quote is, limiting temperature rise to C will require peaking in near-term global, near global energy-related emissions. 
So as I say, um, it's, it's immediate term, in fact, if you look at the other projections from other sources, and indeed if you look at the AR5, which I'm going to end up with here, you'll see it's an we are now in 2016, and emissions have to decline on an immediate basis. Here are emissions from the IPCC AR5. This shows you all the missions, so uh, this is uh, handy for me to include this here, and there are the percentage increases. But on this graph, I wanted to show you this. Because of the ocean thermal inertia, the ocean heat lag, these emissions from around 2000 to today have not yet taken effect on the global surface temperature. That's heat that is still uh, lagging, held up in the oceans, which is going to hit us um, very shortly in the near term. And these emissions are by far the highest that, uh, in cumulative emissions as well, that there has ever been, by far the highest. I'm ending up here, I'm wrapping up here, reminding uh, us all of the most important quote from the AR5, which is the substantial emissions reductions over the next few decades. Obviously, to do that, we have to get global emissions into decline now. Um, the IPCC, by the way, has been saying it now since 2007. That was the AR4 assessment, and again, they said now in the 2014 assessment and near-zero-term emissions. Now, this is what I want to point out here to wrap up with the only scenario that can do that. Of all the scenarios that the IPCC uh, tested, made projections on, the only one that could give us substantial emissions reductions over the next few decades, and the only one that could lead in 2100 to a global surface temperature increase not above 2 degrees C is this one here, which is, not surprisingly, the best case AR5 scenario, which is called RCP 2.6. This is the mean, this is that uh, better than 60% chance of 2 degrees C, but only up to 2100. And this is the more stringent range and uh, this gives us a better chance of 2 degrees C. Now you see that here emissions decline right now, right now. However you look at it, we've now reached that point. We've now reached a more than historic crossroads for humanity. And also, we're talking about all life on Earth here, a crossroads of, of now. Emissions have to decline now on an immediate basis, and they can. So this is my final report. I'm ending on a bit of a positive up note here. Uh, this was published 2nd of November 2016 this month. It's a report for the UNEP, and it's uh, published by the Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and it is Global Trends in Renewable Energy Investment. 2016 assessed the uh, situation from last year, 2015, and the great news was that 2015 produced a new record for global investment in renewable energy. This was despite a seemingly adverse situation for renewables with uh, currency values and also, of course, the declining uh, price of, uh, of fossil fuels and fossil fuel energy. So this is great news so long as we bear in mind that the emissions of uh, fossil fuels, the carbon dioxide emissions and the methane emissions, which are large now from natural gas, uh, particularly from fugitive emissions as fracking expands, the natural gas industry expands so long as those reach nearly zero. So as renewable energy increases, uh, we have to get fossil fuel energy to decline rapidly. And currently that's certainly not happening. And so this is um, uh, conditional great news, I guess. And with that, I'll take my leave of you and um, uh, wish you goodbye.